my dear ones, and welcome into the sanctuary. How are we all doing? I see some of us are fanning ourselves, or a little hot. Is the air right? Is there anything needs to be done with that? I'm not sure. Anyway, Paul is on it. Paul is on it. Okay, soon we'll be freezing and wanting a shawl. <laughs> Isn't it always the way? So here we are in the midst of another um, week of sorrow and sadness and loss and grief and all that goes with that. And we wonder to ourselves, will it ever end? Is it getting worse? What's going on? And that's a normal human response. But we have to know, those of us in this room, that we are not getting worse and that it is getting better no matter what the appearances are. Life is advancing, life is going forward, and life is unfolding the way life is supposed to unfold. And so it's no small accident that here we are as a worldwide community thinking about forgiveness and loving kindness today. That's what we're asked to look at, forgiveness in particular. And uh, the topic for today was why forgiveness? Because, and you may say, well, that's a silly question, why forgiveness? But as I have discovered, and maybe you have discovered, there are many amongst us that are not yet able to forgive for whatever reason. And some of those folk are even part of our own community. And I'm not one for saying that you have to do anything. Um, we can only be in whatever situation we're in uh, when we can be in it. And that can only happen in the ripeness of time. There's no right time for any good thing to happen or any bad thing to happen. It happens when it happens. And so we have to look at that today and see where we are with all of this thing called forgiveness, which is the most huge challenging thing uh, that there is in our lives uh, just now or at any time. It's, um, it's, it's a, a great challenge. It's a great challenge. Um, some of us get upset when I talk about things because of uh, our teaching as being hard. Well, we have to get over that because there are some things that are hard. When you're a human being on planet Earth, there are some things that are harder than others. So what? It's just hard. doesn't mean I can't do it. It's hard. But that doesn't mean I cannot do it. And your experience and mine is that anything I have taken on that's hard and have succeeded and achieved in, we far more appreciate it than the things that were easy. So forgiveness, why forgiveness? Well, why forgiveness is because forgiveness is a necessary ingredient in this thing called love. There is no love if there's no forgiveness in it. There is no love if there's no forgiveness in it. Forgiveness is a seminal part of what it is to love and be loved and to experience love. Now, as there are as many people on this planet, there will be the, those many definitions of love. And of course, none of them measure up, not one of them. Even the best amongst us who have the highest conscious awareness and define love, there'd still be something that we could add on to that because we're, we're filtering it through an individualized consciousness. So um, love, consequently, therefore, it can only be love when it is unconditional. And I don't know what it is that we don't understand about that word. Unconditional. Now, whatever else relationships are, call them what you like, they're not loving relationships if they're not unconditional. And in relationships, oh my goodness me, from sitting in office after office after office during my lifetime and listening to people when they come into a counseling situation, um, there are so many strings attached to people's loving and so many endeavors for control in people's loving and so on that I think we're doing very well considering how we haven't a clue about unconditional love. I do. I think that the tenacity of spirit in us will haul us up by the bootstraps one way or another. So forgiveness is an essential part of this thing called love, this thing called life. 
and it's, it's not something that we can minimize, and it's not something that we can quickly move into or through. It takes its process, whatever its process is. But all we need to have is a willingness, a willingness, an openness to moving through the process. And um, Jampolsky, again, says in his book on forgiveness and healing, um, you have to practice the four R's when it comes to forgiveness. Um, and the first one is responsibility. You have to be a responsible person, take responsibility for our own part in whatever the situation is. And then we have to be willing to um, see that we are able to be empathetic and compassionate in and all, and consequently have some kind of remorse around it. Even though we may not have instigated the thing, but we can be remorseful that this thing happened. We can be uh, of that feeling, which didn't happen. Uh, I don't want it to happen again. And if we have had a hand in it, then to be uh, remorseful or have that sense that, well, I'm sorry that happened and I'm going to endeavor not to let it happen again. And the next one is repair. Be willing to you know, start any process that, that we can repair the situation in some way and be willing to go there, be willing to participate in that repair. And then the last one is you know, repeat no more. Do not repeat this thing again and again and again, repeat no more. So you have that responsibility, you have that remorse component, you have that repair component, and you have that no more repetition of this component. And these are things for us all, we can all look at those as the week goes through. We understand this thing called forgiveness, because sooner or later we're going to face it down, and we're going to say yes to it one way or another in our eternal lives as they spiral you know, upward. And uh, why not now? Why not now? And of course, it is that egoic mind of us that keeps us from wanting to do that, because it is the egoic mind of us that tells us we should feel self-righteousness. We should feel resentful. It's OK for us to feel w the way we feel, because nobody understands. And if anybody knew exactly what was done to me, and, and so on and so forth, they would understand why I'm slow in this regard, or why um, I just am not going there. And, and that's true, that's true. We would understand each other, humanly speaking. But however, to handle a, hu a situation at the human level is to remain in the problem. It's not going to change. And if anything, it's going to kind of worsen. And so we have to take it to another level. We have to take it to a higher level to be able to do what needs to be done for me. It's not about anybody else. It's for me. It's about me and my well-being and my being able to integrate myself and pull all the fragments together and remember myself and repair myself and uh, recover myself. That's what forgiveness is all about. And so you and I have to be willing to look at that. And of course, in looking at forgiveness, you have to look at the hurts and the wounds and the, you know, the scars and the bruising all over again. But that's what we have to do to heal it. That's what we have to do to heal it. But this time we could do it knowing there's power stronger than I am present to me and assisting me and aiding me and doing the repair really. I'm not doing it. My willingness is doing it. My saying yes to it is doing it. But that, that power that is other than my humanity is what really is causing it to happen. And this is all easy to talk about. It's all easy as a concept. But when it comes to actually getting into the practice of it, it's a whole different thing. Now, there's stuff in all of our lives that perhaps we could revisit and perhaps need a little bit more of that ointment of forgiveness. But when we look out into the world, we see so many things that cause us to, you know, um, just uh, suck in our breath rather than breathe out um, as we look out and ask ourselves that question. I mean, really, it looks like it's getting worse instead of better. I mean, when is this lunacy going to stop? I mean, when are we going to, you know, pull ourselves together and become sane? 
so that we can be here now with each other, understanding that I am you and you are me, like it or not, I am you and you are me. And any time I want to separate myself from you, I've gone into separation from myself. Any time I want to hurt you, I am hurting myself. Any time I want to wave the, the, the fist at you, I'm waving the fist at myself. Well, what does it take for us to get that? Because there is no other. There is only the self. There's no other. There's only the self, and each one of us is a, is, a, is a beat in the heart of the one self, a breath in the breath of the one self. There's only the one self. I don't care if I have four legs and eight arms, whether I'm purple with the yellow spots or whatever. That's me. That's me. That's me as much as this is me. And there comes a time when we just have to grow up spiritually, mature spiritually, and get it, and get it. Now, if we don't get it, well, I don't think there's any hope for the world. I mean, we here who espouse unity and harmony and oneness, we here who embrace the understanding and the awareness, there's one life, and that life is my life, that life is all life, and that life is my life now. And so the call for you and the call for me is to stand tall in the face of all of that that's going on and in the face of all the naysaying and in the face of all the fist shaking and stand strong in the awareness that life is unfolding and going forward as it is supposed to. And I'm part of its forward movement. And I won't be any other part in it except part of its forward movement. It's just on a practical level. If you look at the spiritual level, the scriptural spiritual level across all the board of scriptures, it's the same thing. You will love everyone if you want to spiritually realize yourself. And there's no ifs, ands, and buts or doubts about it. That's what you will do. You will love everyone because there's no everyone. There's just you in everyone and everyone in you. So embrace it all, good, bad, and indifferent. The way you have to embrace the good, bad, and indifferent in your own life, you embrace the good and the bad and the indifferent in the life out there. That's not to say that you and I for one second will condone anything, anything that goes against the truth of being. We do not condone any infliction of any kind of lack or limitation or suffering on anything or anyone. We do not condone it, but we empathize to the degree that we understand that some of us are unconsciously fast snoring asleep to who we are and what we are and haven't got a clue. And because we're in that insane sleepiness, we do insane things. I'm everything and everyone and everything and everyone is me never changes, no matter what that looks like out there. I am everything and everyone and everything and everyone is me. So, what do the Holy Scriptures say? Love your enemy, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you. Wow, when did you last do that? When did I last do that? There, there doesn't seem to be any, you know, space in between. How many times should I forgive? You will forgive 70 times 7, which means all the time. 70 times 7 just means all the time, every time. And you're taking this wonderful, you're standing in this beautiful place, this lovely, um, you know, place of worship, and you have your gift in your hand, and you're just waiting your turn to bring it up and present it at the altar. And we're told, well, if on the way you might think of somebody who has something against you, leave your gift, go away, and be reconciled with that somebody who has something against you, and then come back and lay your gift at the altar. It's very, very high, high spiritual truth that you and I are called to. Very, very high. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
We haven't a clue. Because if we had a clue, life wouldn't be the way it is now on this plane. And we're the ones who are clued in in a little bit anyway. And yet, look what goes on in our own lives. So what can we do? What can be done? For the call has come. We must be what we can be and do the one thing that we can do. If things are to change in the outer world, they must first change in the inner world. How are they going to change? Are we waiting for some great group to come along? Some great Messiah to show up amongst us? Some great something or another out there that's going to swoop in with the answer and solve the whole thing and wave the magic wand and we're all wonderful again and loving and kind and beautiful with each other. Peace on earth, goodwill to all. Yes. Well, it's not going to happen because no one's coming and there's no group out there can do it. I don't care what the group is. It can only be done one individual at a time, one mind at a time, one heart at a time, one decision at a time, one change at a time. And therefore, it's all on your shoulders and mine. That's what the world is waiting for, you and me to wake up and be all that we can be and to bring to this life what we are well equipped to bring to this life. The expression goes, my peace be with you. That's your calling and mine today. Everywhere you go now, you have to be thinking and feeling in terms of my peace be with you, my peace be with you, my peace be with you, which is the Christ peace, the Buddha peace, the Thich Nhat Hanh peace, the Dalai Lama peace, the Gandhi peace. This is the peace that the world needs right now. Well, it's not easy to forgive, people tell me all over the place. It's true, it's not easy to forgive, but you know, that doesn't mean it's not doable. And we have wonderful and glorious examples to look to. We have Nelson Mandela imprisoned for so long and treated his prisoners, or treated his guards with respect and honor very respectful. We have Gandhi, you know, the last breath going down, dying from the assassin's hand, greeting and blessing the light of God in his murderer, embracing his murderer as God. You have that wonderful group of Amish families who were able to forgive the man who took the lives of their children. You have a wonderful man whose son was mowed down by a gang member, and the gang member was put away for a long time, and that man befriended the one who killed his son and worked very hard to get his sentence reduced and succeeded, and now works with that young man to bring peace to the streets in the ganglands. I could go on and on and on with the stories. They're myriad. If these people can do that and be that, we sure as heck can get our act together and be a peace builder and a peace bringer under our own rules to begin with. And that's challenge enough sometimes. Then in our workplaces, and that's challenge. Then wherever we gather, we can be a bridge. We can be a bridge. We can build a bridge to peace wherever we are. But it's not going to happen until we first get it together under the roof of our own minds. Is that what I want to be? See, I wonder how many of us ask ourselves the question in the morning, do I want to be a peace builder today? Do I want to build a bridge today? Do, want, do I want to be a provider of a peace bridge today? Do I really want to do that? It's a good question to ask ourselves because that's what this world needs right now. That's what your home needs, that's what your workplace needs, that's what your community needs, that's what your country needs, that's what your world needs. You as a peacemaker. 
It's not going to happen as long as you and I are so frantically distracted. And we're distracted all the time. I'm going to keep pushing the idea of being here now. Be present wherever you are. We're getting more and more um, less present to each other with the advancement of technology. It's getting to be ridiculously, comedically, awfully funny. Over and over again, wherever you gather, where two or three are gathered, there is a cell phone in the midst. <laughs> And I've watched it at meetings, I've watched it two, one to one, I've watched it people eating together. There it is on the table, and every now and again there's glancing down, glancing down, glancing down. In fact, it's more barefaced in some cases. Uh, a couple, as I shared this morning, were in a restaurant with me yesterday, and there they were. He was on his phone, they'd order their food, he was on his phone. She was just sitting there, looking comfortable enough, but just sitting there, he was going crazy on his phone, and. Uh, Eventually, she picked up a menu to, to kind of amuse herself with and uh, read through it until the food came. And I thought, oh, the food is here, and now they can talk. No, they didn't. He was still on his phone eating the food and so on. I don't know how present he was to that, but there he was. Anyway, here's the thing. Why is it that we are so besotted by gadgetry? I'll tell you why. It stops us, prevents us from being in the moment now, handling the moment now, because we think that the past or the future is far more important than being here now and the present. We don't want to miss anything that has happened just a few minutes ago. We don't want to miss anything that's coming up a few minutes from now. So we check, 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 check. You know that that's what's going on. How can I be all that I am capable of being when I'm there and there and there and there and there and there, but I'm never here, or rarely. I could get a problem with my legs with the way it's going. <laughs> it's nice to stand still. It's nice to be still. It's nice to shut up and listen. It's good to shut up and listen. It's healing to shut up and listen. It's pacifying to shut up and listen. It really, really is. I've got to understand that there is no arriving. I'm already here now. There's not going to be peace. Peace is here now. There's not going to be change. Change is here now, now, now. It can't happen any other place. Right now, it's got to happen. Here and here. Mind and heart. And when that happens, I'm telling you, our lives blossom, blossom, consciousness blossoms. Love blossoms, unity blossoms, harmony appears. Oh my goodness, let's try it. Obviously it has not been tried yet or be living in a different world, wouldn't we? We certainly were. That's what, you know, I mean, Gandhi said of, of Christians, for example, and I can speak of Christians because that's what I was raised up in. Um, you know, I love Christ. It's just the Christians I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> and then another, another great person whose name eludes me right now said, you know, Christianity is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened. Too bad it's never been tried yet. <laughs> You know, who's going to be the triers of being peace builders, if not you, if not me? We're the ones, and we have got to get it together enough to rise up out of the inertia that we sometimes experience, out of the fear and anxiety that we allow ourselves to embrace, out of the feeling that I'm not enough. I'm sick and tired of the not enoughness. You are enough. You always have been enough. You always will be enough. And there's nothing more out there for you to get. Nothing more. You might think that getting more knowledge and knowledge and knowledge is getting it. It's not. You're just adding to the body of knowledge. That doesn't mean you're freeing your soul to soar. Quietness, quietness, silence, silence, stillness, stillness. The gap, the gap, the gap in between all the thinking. The gap, the gap, the gap. That's the secret place of the most high conscious awareness in you. 
go for the gap, I say. Let's go for the gap and be what we need to be right now so that the world can come together as one, so that the world can start to really and truly heal. But it's not going to without you, without you, without you. Yes, you're that important. Yes, you're that important. And let us be what we can be where we are right here, right now, right here, right now, present, awake and alert and ready for grace to shower itself through us and as a result of that, lighten up the whole place. And so it is. Woo! Woo!